change that all. Can you can you hear me now? Right, thank you. Before I start, um, are there any questions from any one of you on what we had covered uh, last time? I didn't see it. Michael, you asked for a recording. I didn't see the recording. I I was up. Uh, <coughs> actually, I I didn't even find a course at uh, So Two Point Zero, um, but I'm sure this will be sorted out. And in in any event. Um, I think both the recording and uh, and also the assignment, if you haven't got it, um, they should be uploaded uh, in due course. Right, uh, reference books. Uh, the the short answer is uh, well. First of all, um, let me let me see. We covered this last time. Uh, you were recommended three. Uh, you were. Let me let me take you to the slide. Well, um, first of all, there the, 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 there is this book, Introduction to the Hong Kong Basic Law. Uh, written by um, Mr. Danny Gittings. And this one is second edition, which uh, was 2016. And of course, we know uh, since 2016, uh, a lot of things have happened and uh, which will have an impact on our study of the basic law. Um, but this will be a very good reference book um, because the manual that we have, um, it basically provides everything that you have to know uh, for the purpose of this course. Um, <clears throat> for those who are interested in doing a lot of serious reading, um, you, you have uh, what was introduced to you. The um, uh, this, this will be the law of the Hong Kong Constitution and. Um, Again, we made reference to it last lecture. And this was uh, written by um, Jonas Chan and uh, others. Uh, so this is a heavy uh, reference book. I don't expect you buying it. And, um, there are quite a few other um, a useful book on the basic law. Uh, Few of them were written in English. Uh, there were a couple uh, which uh, were translations of the of uh, books on the basic law uh, written by mainland scholars and uh, translated into uh, English. Um, you will find them uh, in the in library. Uh, 
this one, uh, I'm sure you will be able to find it in the library. This is on One Country, Two Systems, and it was written by uh, Professor Xiao Weiyuan. Professor Xiao Weiyuan. Uh, this one um, uh, was uh, contains a lot of historical um, uh, information and also uh, provide useful background uh, for understanding um, the both the drafting and the policy underlying uh, various articles in the basic law. Mm, there's one other. Let me Uh, okay, another one by a mainland scholar, and uh, I don't know whether you can see this one, the in introduction to uh, the basic law of Hong Kong SAR. Uh, this one was written by um, Wong Sukman. Uh, Wong Sukman. So these are the English ones, and, and then there, there are of course many uh, reference books on the Chinese. And uh, apart from these books, I must mention a very useful resource. I can't remember whether I mentioned it last time. And that was uh, the um, Department of Justice website. Uh, you go to that website, look for the basic law, and uh, it contains um, a very useful information. Uh, and, and, and that is uh, within the legal context, uh, um, both uh, explanation of the uh, various provisions and also a collection of cases, very different cases. And also the Department of Justice or, uh, has compiled uh, what they call the Basic Law Bulletin um, that uh, uh, it used to be uh, published more regularly than uh, recently, and um, and that also provide uh, uh, very useful uh, objective and scholarly information on the basic law. So, uh, so just going back to the question, uh, Jay Honlon put it, a race about buying reference book. For this course, uh, um, what I had said was uh, the menu was would be enough for you to know uh, the information that you require to need to know in order to pass the examination. Together with uh, what I will cover uh, uh, during lectures, uh, again the the lecture and the published material, of course, there's. Uh, in very inevitably, there's a time gap, so I will be introducing uh, more recent uh, material, uh, which um, I thought would be relevant and useful for your learning the basic law. And for the purpose of this course, I mentioned last time, apart from the menu. There is also a binder uh, containing uh, reference materials, which contain the basic law, extracts of the basic law itself, and other documents. Some, uh, so you will have that. You should, you should have that with you. And uh, later on, you will be, you, you will be issued with uh, some past paper, exam papers uh, uh, for the. For the for the uh, subjects that you are doing for the purpose of this course, 
That, of course, uh, is for revision uh, purpose. Now, uh, so apart from this question, uh, are there other questions on what on the content that we had covered last time? You got something to say? Is that Mr. Kong? Kong Wing Ji, can you hear me? Uh, because I, I saw that you got a you got an icon uh, against your name, so. Right. Uh, now, if you don't have question, now, now I can ask you some question, can I? Okay, can, can I ask, um, if you remember, what what did I ask you to do um, um, when we had well, Tuesday? I asked you to go home and prepare something. Remember what what was it that I asked you, I asked you to do? Passing. Um, I gather from s some of your colleagues, some of those classmates, that actually the menu is already uploaded, and uh, I don't know when you can collect your uh, hard copy of the menu. Uh, normally, is before the. I mean, if it wasn't because of the pandemic, uh, you would have been asked to come over to um, to collect it. Right. Celine, uh, go over the short preamble. Well, uh, that is the beginning. I mean, it's part of it. That's right. Uh, Chi Ho, uh, you got it. Now, that's right, Philip. Yes, very good. So I, I can expect you so we can do some interaction, interactive activity now. Um, let me see how many of us have turned up now, 56, yeah. Uh, shall we do that together? Okay, good. Now, um, there aren't that many, but um, I hope you have. Oh, received the course manual yesterday in the mail. That's very good. So uh, for those who haven't received them, um, you, you must be able to expect uh, them through the mail uh, very soon then. Mm. Does everybody have the, let me see if I can. Um,
Well, I was trying to upload the um, the uh, menu. Unfortunately, it tells me that I can't do it. I don't know why. Um, well, in that case, I'll, I'll give up the idea then. Um, Right. Uh, let me ask the the question one then. First of all, um, question one. It says identify at least one article or part of the preamble in the Hong Kong Basic Law that reflects the basic policy, and write the article number in the space below. Uh, that is in relation to the main text of the Sino-British Joint Declaration, and you can find this on page 13 of your menu. And of course, is this preamble paragraph 2? Preamble paragraph 2. Which I sort of took you through last time. Mm. Can I ask one of you to uh, go through that with us? Uh, Chen Xiao, Chen Xiao, Chen Xiao. Can you hear me? Um, is the Chen Song? What I would like to do actually is to um, impress upon you the importance of the joint declaration and um, relate that to the various provisions in the basic law um, so that so that uh, when we study the basic law um, <clears throat> we will be we will be aware of uh, the historical context and therefore, it's not something that you know suddenly came out of the blue, but it does have a background, and that background, um, as you will learn, uh, is very, very important for our understanding of the basic law, and also uh, when it comes to interpreting uh, the various provisions in the basic law, because uh, as now the Court of Final Appeal has. Time after time, reminding everybody and reminding <coughs> those uh, litigants before the court that uh, uh, because of the nature of the basic law uh, interpretation, uh, we should apply the purposive interpretation in context of the provisions and looking at the basic law as a whole. Ms. Chen, uh, can, is that Ms. Chen? I turn on your microphone. Can can you respond? I saw that you're typing. Do I have you here? Do I have Chen Xiao here?
Do I have any volunteers from among our class to deal with the first question? Chen Kim, Article 1. Yes, can you explain uh, what, why do you think um, Article 1 uh, is a provision that reflects the basic policy written, uh, uh, <coughs> declared in the Joint Declaration. And um, yeah, let, let me have uh, Simon. Simon, can you can you elaborate on your your response that you thought Article One is an article which reflects the policy which is uh, set out in paragraph three one of the Joint Declarations. Can I so maybe I turn on your microphone is easier if you you can talk rather than type. Are you able to speak to the to your microphone, Simon? Yeah, I saw you type in in alien both part. So, what do you mean? I mean, yes, I mean Article One. There is the, the there are these words a in alien both part. So how 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 do you how is this relevant to the basic policy? I saw that you tell me who can help me. Um, uh, I I really hope that uh, you you are able to um, find the time to um, go through these documents. This uh, is a very fundamental, very important part of the of the, the learning of the basic law, um, upholding national unity and territorial integrity. Right, that is uh, the, that's right, 
So uh, that that's something that I kept repeating and say when we know when we read the basic law, uh, when we learn the basic law, we have to know um, the background and national unity. Something I mentioned uh, in our last lectures slides uh, about you know after the uh, how how it was after the Cultural Revolution uh, that um, in the context of uh, um, <clears throat> seeking to unify uh, the country by uh, beginning. Uh, Taiwan, reunifying Taiwan, and also Hong Kong and Macau. More importantly, uh, when in 1981, China put forward the nine principles for reunifying Taiwan. And it was in 82 when Article 31 of the Constitution was added to the then constitution and became uh, uh, part of the 1982 constitution and, and that provision uh, empowers the central authority to establish a, a, um, a system different from that uh, practicing uh, in the country uh, and to enact law to give effect to that. Right, that was Article 31, and that provision, of course, is reflect is referred to in the joint declarations, and so, and and it was also referred to in the second paragraph of uh, the preamble of the preamble to the Basic Law. Has anybody uh, has anybody find out trying to find out what Article Thirty One of the uh, Chinese Constitution uh, says? Article Thirty One. We try to look it up. Can we try to look it up. And you have, if you have, please tell me what it, what it says. Yeah, um, well, Yan, I think what what you uh, what you uh, extracted was a description of the effect of Article Thirty One. I had uh, typed in the um, actual text of that article, and uh, it says the state may establish special administrative regions when necessary. The systems to be instituted in the special administrative regions 
shall be prescribed by law enacted by the National People's Congress in the light of specific conditions. So that's Article 31 of the Basic Law. Um, uh, and Boxing. That's right. It, we are talking about the the um, constitution, right? So that's this is why I thought it's important we go through this together. Article thirty one of the constitution is uh, boxing. You mentioned freedom of movement. That that is the basic law provision. Mm -hmm. So. And uh, Kui Ji Hang gave us a link. Let me see what, what that link is. That's right. This is a link to the basic law. And, and here uh, you will find the constitution there as well. And of course, in here, the constitution, uh, you will see uh, under general principles, Article 31. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you very much. And for those, uh, uh, that's a useful link. Um, I didn't mention that one, uh, uh, but this is also one which uh, you can find a lot of reference materials. Uh, indeed, it has done a very good database on the relevant court judgments on the basic law. Uh, unfortunately, it, it it's yet to be completed. It, 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 it has done uh, up to, I think, Article 40 something, but uh, it's, it's already quite uh, an a, a important, meaningful task. Right. Um, so that, that is on question one. Um, and um, <clears throat> oh, there was a reference to Article 5. Can, can somebody tell me why Article 5 is, is well, Article 5 of the basic law, of the Hong Kong basic law, is, is, is relevant? Michael, you have, uh, I think you, that's the link to the Constitution. Let me see. That's correct. That's the 1982 Constitution. And uh, there are quite, uh, there are, a few articles in the Constitution which are particularly relevant to us, to, to Hong Kong. And uh, if you turn turn on that one, you will see that um, Article 31 uh, uh, is the one that we, we, we refer to very often. And then there will be those articles uh, relating to the powers of the National People's Congress and also the uh, 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 Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, and, and um, you will be Uh, I'm just I'm just uh, having it shown here for you to for us to share, and you will see that um, can you see that? Can you see it on on your screen? I'm I'm taking you to thirty one, yeah, and that is the state. So that is 31, okay? The state may establish special administrative, administrative regions when necessary. The system to be instituted in special administrative regions shall be prescribed by law, enacted by the National People's Congress in the light of specific conditions. Uh, um, I should mention at this point that um, um, you will hear um, 
this uh, sometimes you, you hear the reference to unitary state. China or PR, PR, uh, PRC is a unitary state, right? Which is different from that of a republic, uh, of a, a federation, or a pub, a, a confederation. Uh, what it actually means is uh, uh, there is only one state. And that is PRC, and all the powers, all the powers rests with the PRC, and uh, uh, and in the case of Hong Kong, it is a special administrative region within the uh, con in the country, uh, which is given which is uh, dedicated uh, with a high degree of autonomy, exercising administrative powers, uh, legislative powers, and also independent uh, uh, power of adjudication, including the uh, uh, final, Court of Final Appeal, including the final powers. And uh, you will see, I'm just taking you to um, the article, which tells you how China is um, the structure of the country is I just missed that um, uh, it tells you that yes article 30 the administrative divisions can you see that administrative divisions of the PRC is as follows the country is divided into provinces autonomous regions and municipalities directly under the central government directly under the central government. Central government in the uh, context of Chinese, the China, PRC's constitution, it is the, uh, 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 the, the central people's government, the, cent, the CPG, and also um, uh, uh, which is governed by the state council, the state council. So following that, uh, uh, the top level of uh, uh, administrative division, provinces, autonomous regions, municipalities. Next are the, and then under the province, they are divided into autonomous prefectures, counties, autonomous counties and cities. And then the counties, under counties, then it goes on to dividing the, the uh, down level, down one level to towns, nationality township and towns and municipalities directly under the central government and other large cities are divided into district counties autonomous prefectures and so on this would include uh, 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 the the uh, in chinese you, you look at uh, the china on the chinese uh, 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 text is uh, these are directly under the central government. All right. So, and, and Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a special administrative region, special administrative region, which is uh, within this structure is at the top level, top level. So sometimes we say that, uh, 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 roughly, we say that uh, uh, the, the chief executive of Hong Kong SAR, uh, the ranking uh, can, you can sort of draw, uh, is roughly on par with the, the mayor, uh, Sang Jiang, uh, Sang Jiang. Uh, this is about the ministerial rank, about ministerial rank within the Chinese structure. And uh, I will also encourage you to really read this um, uh, constitution, um, and, and you can see the importance is quite quite, not, quite uh, obvious because we're we are looking we are uh, in an environment of one country two systems. That therefore, the we really we have to know what the country is, and of course, the 
goes without saying is PRC. But what is PRC from the legal and constitutional point of view? Uh, that you can only uh, understand it accurately by reading and understanding the uh, Constitution. Now, I, I'm going to take you to Constitution 64 and 67, uh, 63, first of all, 63, uh, let me see, okay, 62, first of all, the National People's Congress uh, exercises the following functions and powers. Now, this is what the Constitution does. Uh, it allocates powers. It allocates powers. So um, you will see that um, the oh, 61. Uh, just sixty-two. The NPC. Uh, enact and amend basic laws right so this is the Hong Kong uh, SAR basic law and the Macau basic law they were enacted by the NBC enacted by the NBC and um, and also to decide on the establishment of special administrative regions and the systems to be instituted there. So under the PRC constitution, uh, the Hong Kong Basic Law was made by the NBC, and then uh, it, that, that's a matter of law, and uh, it can also make decisions on the establishment of the SAR, and that is and, and, uh, uh, prescribed by law, and the system to be instituted there, and, and you can you will see that um, the NPC has since 1997 uh, make a couple of decisions which uh, uh, of, uh, have the force of law and been acted upon by both the uh, by the standing committee by the standing committee of the National People's Congress, and. Uh, and what is the National People's Congress? It's an expression we often have to remember. It is the highest organ of state power. Highest organ of state power. It's the highest organ of state power. So NPC is not just a lawmaking body. It is not a parliament. It is the highest organ of state power. All the powers of a unitary state rests with this organ. Um, so it has the power to govern. It is is uh, uh, it got executive powers. It has also got legislative powers. You see. It can the the executive powers include the power to remove the president, remove the premier, and even the military head of military, judiciary, president of the Supreme Court, and law enforcement, the the procur procurator general and supreme uh, of the Supreme People's Procurator procur uh, Procuratorate. So there's no, you can understand, there's no separation of power. There's no separation of power concept. Uh, or, or in fact, the system itself is not separation of power at all. Got it? So this is National People's Congress. And, um, and then National People's Congress only meets uh, once. A year, normally in the months of May, uh, March, and uh, when they meet, is normally meeting. They meet about two weeks. But this year, uh, because of the pandemic, of course, they have to change their meeting schedule. 
and the next I want to and and and, and because of the in 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 frequency of meeting, they need a uh, standing committee. A standing committee. The standing committee uh, is the executive arm of the MPC. It actually performs the functions of the MPC uh, when the standing committee is not uh, a, a meeting. Right. So. Um, So we will have this is the standing committee, and um, what powers does it have? Let's see, sixty-seven. Oh, I beg pardon. I had oh, no, 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 no. Why they're there? Anyway, um, I'm not quite quite used to this marking system. Right. Okay. So um, the standing committee it interprets the constitution. It enacts and amend law with exception of those which should be enacted by the NPC. So the basic law can only be the basic law of Hong Kong SAR can only be enacted by uh, the uh, MPC, so standing committee can can uh, 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 amend the law. Or first of all, can if it's not for the MPC to enact the basic law, nor can it amend it. But interestingly, it has the power to it has the power to interpret. I don't know why I have. Got this problem. Right. It interpret. Uh, okay. There's something. Well, I want you to look at this one. The interpret law. I don't know why I'm not able to. Yeah, that's right. Interpret law. Do you see this one? Sixty-seven. Uh, four. This is uh, although we say that PRs, uh, the Senate committee cannot uh, 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 enact or uh, amend the basic law of the uh, special in Hong Kong special administrative region. It has the power under Article sixty seven, bracket four, to interpret laws. Laws here include the basic law. Right, and then it has also other functions and powers, uh, and these are also uh, set out in a long list, in a long list here. And uh, the the one, the catch all one. There's a catch all function at the end is to exercise any such other functions and and powers. As the National People's Congress may assign to it. Right. Um, this constitution. Um, as you can expect from. Uh, a document of this kind mainly contains how uh, the powers are distributed among the organs of power within the country, and also sets out the um, uh, fundamental rights of uh, uh, of the people, and also uh, as far as the Chinese constitution is concerned, there's one very important. Which is in the preamble, which sets out the history and also more the ideology that the the country uh, is founded is founded, and um, and 
the the ideology part if you can see from on this page this um uh let me go here too big Uh, it puts a lot of emphasis on the fact that um, Chinese uh, Pe People's Republic of China is is under uh, the leadership of the Communist Party of China and under the guidance of Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought. Also, um, it is concentrating on its efforts on socialist modernization and. Uh, and one very important concept, and that is adhering to the people's democratic dictatorship and the socialist role, steadily improve the socialist institution, develop socialist democracy, improving socialist legal system. So, and uh, what I've wanted you to um, uh, 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 be aware of is this. Therefore, um, the system that the uh, mainland China, the People's Republic of China, is uh, having is a socialist system, and that is provided by their constitution. And then at the bottom of this page, the People's Republic of China is a unitary multinational state created jointly by the people of all its nationalities. Do you know how many tribes are there in China, in PRC? Do you know how many tribes are there in PRC? Five, one, two. Fifty-one. I think you could Google and see and, and, and find the answer very quickly. I think it's 56. I think it's 56. Uh, there are many, many minorities. Yeah, I think it's 56. And how many provinces are there? Fifty-six provinces? No, 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 no. no that's tribes. Yeah. Okay. So the. Of course, there are many. Uh, I think it's thirty, thirty-two, or I think it's about thirty-two, and then among these, thirty-four, right? Thirty something, and among these, we have. Um, Autonomous regions, and these autonomous regions uh, are actually um, are scattered all over uh, um, PRC, the main on the mainland. Um, um, Inner Mongolia is uh, uh, an autonomous region, and we got uh, within Sichuan, within the Guangxi, uh, within the, of course. Um, uh, 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 Xinjiang, uh, a lot of I mean special and a lot of autonomous regions. Autonomous regions are different from special administrative regions, right? So the, uh, they are subject to different uh, kind of relationship between the central and uh, these various regions. Um, so one country, two systems. We have looked at the country. Uh, this is so and and uh, identified to you in the preamble the reference to socialist system. And Article 1 of the Constitution is the socialist system, it's the basic system of PRC, right? So, and, um, and disruption of socialist system uh, is prohibited. Um, and uh, when we talk about the, uh, democracy, uh, and when you look at the uh, constitution, it puts a lot of emphasis on the uh, 
the country being uh, belong to the people and and and, and therefore uh, uh, the National People's Congress uh, system is is by way of representation at various levels and and uh, so uh, the country belongs to people and uh, and 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 the leadership are actually um, giving effect to the will of the people, right? Um, but there's one term which is uh, very often uh, referred to is uh, democratic dictatorship, um, and that is uh, again in the preamble, it says <coughs> the, the PRC will adhere to the people's democratic dictatorship. Right? Some some would regard this as a contradiction in terms because. Uh, uh, it seemed to suggest uh, when we were taken is uh, if there was democracy, then uh, th there should be no place for dictatorship. And of course, this bear a special meaning within the Chinese constitution. It is uh, among the Chinese people, among the people of the PRC, it's democratic, but uh, uh, in relation to enemies, uh, uh, then uh, the PRC and the constitution, they will exercise some form of dictatorship. Yeah. So this reflect um, some idea. I mean, the, the fundamental ideology of a class struggle, um, and uh, which is unique to to PRC. Right. Um, so uh, that is in the context of looking at the joint declarations, and also um, what. PRC had undertaken, had, uh, had pledged, or promised, and also the, what is Article 31 within the Constitution, and uh, is a big exception it makes because if you, you, you will see, of course, um, from uh, Article 1 of the uh, Constitution, the same paragraph here is the socialist system. If there's any disruption caused to it, I mean, it is prohibited, right? Prohibited. You can't you can't disrupt the socialist system. And yet, uh, uh, when when we get to thirty one, it does allow uh, the state to establish a separate system. All right. So this is a big exception. So. Uh, I want to impress on you that, um, from a legal point of view, what was the basis of uh, uh, the the background to the um, to the uh, basic policy as uh, undertaken, uh, uh, promised by uh, PRC in the joint declaration. Now the next question is. Uh, or rather, the next uh, basic policy is the Hong Kong SAR will be directly under the authority of the CPG of the PRC. Then the Hong Kong SAR will enjoy a high degree of autonomy, except in foreign and defense affairs, which are the responsibilities of central people's government. Article 2, yes, yes, can we have 13 and 14, mm -hmm. And um, please, uh, <clears throat> when you take when you look at Article Thirteen, 
you look at article 13 um, I hope you will see the two expressions which uh, seem to be seem to uh, have an overlap a couple of matters that may overlap when you look at article 13 first paragraph it says that the central people's government shall be responsible for the foreign affairs relating to Hong Kong special administrative region and uh, third paragraph says the central people's government authorizes the Hong Kong SAR to conduct relevant external affairs on its own in accordance with this law the reference to external affairs on the face of it may be part of foreign affairs the external and foreign uh, they are sometimes actually may be regarded as synonyms as, as saying the same thing so be very careful that um, uh, the basic law in the context of uh, according high level of autonomy that also covered conducting relevant external affairs on its own in accordance with the basic law can you think of any example that actually fall within external affairs and, and therefore we do not regard that as uh, foreign affairs <clears throat> airlines the travel bubble tax yes and where can where in the basic law economic cooperation yes where in the basic law can we find this Chapter 5. What's the heading of it? And chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, chapter 7 has there's the heading external affairs All right. so it covers a lot of aspects of activities that involve um, that involve parties outside of China and it covers many many areas of uh, international activities um, Hong Kong taking part in international games, sports games, the Olympics, uh, the Meteorological uh, Union, the Alliance, uh, and uh, a, a member of WTO, uh, issuing passports, uh, airlines, as you said, air services agreements, tax, taxation, uh, we're talking about double taxation eliminate the, the, the uh, double taxation agreements with uh, various uh, parties and even uh, with um, uh, extradition or uh, mutual assistance uh, with the foreign uh, countries on the enforcement of the criminal law all these 
uh, are actually um, conducted by Hong Kong on its own. However, don't forget on its own, but under delegation, under delegation. And this is what it says, what is important here is when you go back to Article 13, Article 13, the key word is authorizes. It is under the authorization of CPG, CPG, Central People's Government, that Hong Kong can conduct these external affairs. Now, it doesn't say every all external affairs, but it says relevant external affairs. And it has to be done in accordance with the basic law, although you can do it on your own, but still in accordance with the basic law. So that, that's where you again um, you should remember this. All right. Uh, I would like us to do at least another one. The Hong Kong, which is uh, basic policy number three, identify, I beg pardon, the Hong Kong SAR will be vested with the executive, legislative, and independent judicial power, including that of final adjudication. The laws currently in force in Hong Kong will remain basically unchanged. So you are being asked to identify these four articles that reflect the above basic policy. Eight, eighteen, nineteen. Tell us how. How do you know? Article one six to Hong Kong. Yes. Cool. Right, that's good on the um good on Article 8, common law, yes. Article 17. Uh, 17 um, is not exactly uh, the, the article that empowers uh, the SAR to, to exercise legislative power. On the contrary, is is a restriction. Now, um, Article Nine uh, Sixteen, Michael, you, you mentioned Sixteen. Um, Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll deal with uh, Article Seventy Seven uh, just a bit later. Um, okay, I'll uh, I'll I'll take the. I was asking Michael about administrative affairs. What what in your mind um, should administrative affairs include? What is administrative affairs?
So, um, 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 how would you classify the building of um, the high-speed train terminal at West Kowloon uh, to enable um, the uh, 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 to enable um, the clearance, the customs and the immigration clearance, uh, both for both Hong Kong and mainland, to be done at the same building. Is that an administrative affair or is it not an administrative affair? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. It's rather, it's rather complicated. I think Michael probably got it right, uh, because the establishment of the custom authorities and the immigration authorities uh, was certainly uh, not something that is administrative affairs of the region. Right. That's one point. Second point is whatever Hong Kong SAR wishes to do or in exercising its executive power, that exercise of power has to be done in accordance with the basic law. So Whenever we talk about high degree of autonomy, it doesn't mean that Hong Kong can do anything it likes, as long as it is within uh, uh, the scope of authority given. Because even if it's within the scope of authority given, it has to be done in accordance with the basic law. It is only in areas where the basic law has not made specific provision, then uh, we might be able to say that Hong Kong will have a freer hand. Will have a freer hand. So it takes back takes us to this um, uh, very interesting uh, way of expressing or describing the status of Hong Kong uh, SAR in relation to the central authority. This is where the question is: Is higher degree of autonomy? the same as having autonomy. Is higher degree is higher degree of autonomy um, does that does that does higher degree of autonomy give you uh, give Hong Kong SAR more power than an autonomous region within China, within mainland China? You see what I mean? Some may say that, well, Hong Kong is not only enjoying autonomy, it is a higher degree, it is a high degree of autonomy. It's not only autonomy, but high degree of autonomy. The other way of, of, the, of the same coin may be saying that, well, Hong Kong is not having autonomy, but only a high degree of autonomy. It's not quite autonomy. You see what I mean? This is simply uh, a matter of literary, uh, literal logic. But the key concept, 
that we have to master is whatever Hong Kong's power, administrative power especially, or executive power is given, it is given subject to as a matter of authorization in the form of authorization and also uh, uh, subject to limitations and restrictions imposed by the Hong Kong Basic Law. Uh, Alice, you have a question on Article 77. Can you can you elaborate on your question? Uh, you asked me to explain about the mu something. Article 77. Um, it says this, members of the Legislative Council of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall be immune from legal action in respect of their statements at meetings of the Council. This is a uh, this gives the um, uh, members of legislative council a protection against any legal against civil actions that may arise from their statements from what they say in just at meetings of the legislative council. Um, it says immune from legal action. Uh, what may seem what may seem unclear is whether legal action includes criminal action. Criminal action are they immune from being prosecuted? Immune from prosecuted. Um, the under the common law, such immunity does not extend to criminal conduct. This is um, this principle is well established. Uh, the latest case uh, is one from UK uh, uh, Supreme Court, the case of Chater, the case of Chater, where uh, the the members of Parliament of UK House of Commons had um, uh, 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 have been prosecuted from uh, defrauding the authorities by making uh, claims for allowances beyond what they are entitled to, and um, the a provision of substantial substantively the same effect. Is contained in the Legislative Council Powers and Privileges Ordinance as well. And whether that is going to be, and, and at the moment, and then you have seen quite a few cases at the lower level courts in Hong Kong where legislative councillors have been prosecuted by their uh, uh, conducts. Not statement, but the conduct, uh, physical conduct. Uh, in the, as far as statement is concerned, uh, we've yet to see any cases yet. Um, it is going to bring into. Oh, somebody had actually raised this as a question in the context of the national security law. Because some of the crimes uh, contained uh, and made by the national security law direct against are directed against statements that may have the effect of inciting uh, people uh, uh, to uh, engage in subversive act actions against the state. Um, on the face of it, um, that conduct. Uh, May fall within Article seventy seven because if it was by mere words said at meetings of council, they may be immune from legal action. Whether that is the case, 
we, we really have to see how this provision uh, will be interpreted uh, 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 by the courts and eventually, if necessary, by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. Alice? Um, not in Hong Kong. The one similar case uh, which involved New Zealand uh, in New Zealand Parliament, but that is in relation to uh, just the opposite of it, where some def defamatory statements were made in the, in court, and that is not criminal anyway; it's civil. And uh, the parliamentarian, the MP, made the same statement or adopted the same statement outside of Parliament, and he was sued. Um, uh, the Privy Council. Uh, make it very clear that uh, a statement made outside of the proceedings of the parliament are not immune from legal action. Uh, but that's in the civil context. Right, it's 8.25. Uh, let's take a short break and uh, come back um, uh, 15 minutes. And before I do that, any questions? Do you have any other questions? All right, then Let, let's come back uh, 15 minutes.
Yes, we are recording now. Now, um, let's do a, do a few more. I, I always consider this as a very important part of the exercise of, of our course to, to really get you to reading uh, the basic law and the joint declaration. And uh, from my experience, every time when you go to the basic law, every time when you start reading a provision that you thought you knew, but uh, you will find a, a new new issue, a new question, and, um, and and that makes therefore the study of the basic law very that more interesting. Now um, we are looking at the uh, uh, we we've got a lot of things to say in relation to the third uh, basic policy, but uh, we'll save that for later. But uh, let's move on to four. Uh, that is about you know um, what it says. Uh, the the government will compose of local inhabitants, the CE appointed by the chief by the central people's government, on the basis of the result of elections or consultations, and then principal officials will be nominated and appointed by CBG, and foreign nationals. Uh, Will, uh, who have previously worked in the public sector um, continues to remain to, to, to be in employment. And, um, and then the foreign nationals can continue to be employed to uh, work as advisors or consultants, despite the very fundamental principle that they should be Hong Kong people who live in Hong Kong. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't do anything to kick anybody out. Um, well, the recorded uh, video will be on Seoul. And uh, if you can't find it now, it's only because it has not been uploaded. It will, it will be there, I assure you. But uh, I I I checked it just before we started this evening. I and I didn't see it, so uh, uh, I am not in a bet a position better than you are. Um, okay, so the question four, uh, pages fourteen and fifteen of your menu. And again, the the, the exercise is to identify the uh, provisions in the basic law uh, which uh, reflect the, the basic policy. Fifteen. Shall we look at fifteen? Fifteen. Right. Can you hear it better? Sorry, I was uh, right. Um, the state. Oh, pardon. I, I was uh, <laughs> still on the on the constitution. Fifteen says. The CPG shall appoint its chief executive and principal officials in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 4. Um, now, the location of uh, Article 15 is in Chapter 2. And Chapter 2 is about the relationship between central authority and Hong Kong SAR. So um, this is the chapter which uh, deals with relationship uh, as the focus. So it, it doesn't go to nitty gritty 
uh, and you will find, for example, Article 15 is uh, uh, an example where in relation to the detail of implementation, you have to, uh, uh, that is placed in another chapter, and in this case, chapter 4, chapter 4. Chapter 4 is on the political, political uh, structure of Hong Kong SAR. Okay. And uh, Mr. Wong said Article 21 as well. Let's see what Article 21 says then. Chinese citizens who are residents of Hong Kong SAR shall be entitled to participate in the management of state affairs according to law. What do you mean by state affairs here? Hmm? Means affairs of the country. And it goes on to say, in, in accordance with the assigned number of seats and selection methods specified by NPC, the Chinese citizen among residents of Hong Kong SAR shall locally elect deputies to the National People's Congress to, sub, to participate in the work of the highest organ of state power. You remember what is the highest, which is the highest organ of state power in, in mainland China? NPC, that's why. Chan Ho, when you say very engaging, what does that mean? What 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 are what are you referring to? Engaging? Very engaging, right? So 21 is not quite um, we were looking for, right? 21 is really the relationship about Hong Kong people, um, I mean, Hong Kong citizens could be elected to sit on the National People's Congress. At the moment, there are 36 deputies sitting there, and which is a, 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 a number uh, uh, for the size of Hong Kong's population is bigger than normally the case. Uh, Stephanie trying to join. Um, okay, where is... But I don't see... Um, there's no... I'm afraid she has to find... Hmm. Stephanie would be as it don't chuck in. Yeah, her name is not on the list of attendees. Not don't chuck don't chuck in. No, I'm afraid I don't see her. If I don't see her I can't admit her. She has to find a way to get in. Okay. So back to so uh, twenty one is not quite, but let's look at forty five. Forty five will be it. Now this is the the article which I had drawn a forty four and forty five. Uh, now we are, I'm talk, we are looking at the basic policy. Now the policy here, you, as far as the uh, personal qualification of CE or CE candidate is concerned, is not here. That's something uh, which uh, uh, came about in later in another context. 
But simply 45, you will see that is this the CE shall be elected, should be selected by election or through consultation. Now, isn't it interesting? I mean, at the moment, uh, there's only one means of selection in Hong Kong for CE, and that is uh, by way of election, by way of election. All right. No consultation. No consultation. Right. I can see Stephanie now, and uh, I just admitted her, and I hope that was successful. Yes, it was. Hi, Stephanie. Can you hear me? Stephanie? Can you hear me? Stephanie? Can you hear me? Can you say something? Uh, yes, I hear you. Thank you. That's good. That's good. Right. Um, so we were looking at 48, 45 is, is definitely right. And then I was also directed to 48. Oh, okay. Um, on this one, uh, I has I just drew your attention to the fact that by uh, uh, in the joint declaration and so as the basic law, there's reference to both election and consultation. Uh, but um, up to this point in time, uh, the um, CE is still by way of uh, e election here. Uh -huh. And uh, of course, falling on, it makes reference to universal suffrage, universal suffrage. Uh, and uh, that, uh, as we know, hasn't come about. Uh, the selection of CE is still governed by Annex 1 and also the subsequent uh, interpretation and decisions made by the Standing Committee of the NPC. This was, of course, we all remember, uh, was uh, quite controversial, this, the entire portion. And um, uh, we were, you know, there were certain uh, proposal uh, put forward for uh, the Hong Kong legislature to consider and and um, passage, but it did not succeed. So. I want to move on to the next one that you refer me to, and that would be 48. 48, um, it is a provision which sets out the uh, powers and functions of uh, the um, chief executive, and among which, of course, uh, there is the uh, appointment, the appointment of uh, 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 principal officials. And they, then that is 48.5. And you see it's the nomination of uh, candidates for appointment as principal officials. And these are all the secretaries and deputy secretaries of departments, directors of bureaus, commissioner against corruption, director of audit, commissioner of police, director of immigration, and commissioner of custom and excise. Uh, these are principal officials and the uh, principal officials uh, reflect they, they are they 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 are of this is uh, reflecting their importance rather than their rank rather than their rank and uh, of course among them the top rank uh, lie with uh, the secretaries those are the top rank and uh, and some are civil servants and some are not. Uh, Commissioner of Police, Director of Immigration, uh, Commissioner of Custom Excise, they are civil servants. And, uh, uh, and the others 
um, what we call um, a, a political appointees, political appointees who have a contractual relationship uh, with the uh, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region government. But uh, at the same time, they are officials appointed by CPG. Okay, and then 100 and 101, I think that those are also important. Uh, 100 is on the, this is about the civil service. And um, before 97, there was a lot of discussion about um, maintaining confidence. And one of the means of doing it is to uh, maintain the previous system, especially the civil servants. And um, so, and, and it was a matter of promise that they will remain in employment. And uh, the term they use is on conditions that are no less favorable than before. No less favorable than before. These are measures adopted uh, beyond beyond or, uh, or in addition to uh, what was uh, uh, declared to be the basic policy in the, in the joint declarations. Right, uh, 101. 101 is, this deals with particularly uh, non-Chinese. Uh, non and uh, in relation to this, in fact, I think it's useful to uh, take us to one provision, which uh, you will see, we will come back to, but uh, this is about judges who, who are not of Chinese origin, not ethnic Chinese. Now, in Hong Kong, uh, the appointment of judges uh, is based on their judicial and professional qualities and ethnic uh, background, uh, uh, nationality are not uh, uh, relevant considerations. And, and indeed, uh, judges who were appointed before 97 it's a promise here by law that they shall remain in employment and retain their seniority with pay. And again, the usual, the 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 um, the, 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 the the same expression, no less favorable than before, is used here. Same as the uh, guarantee provided for civil other civil servants. The statement in four contradicting Article sixty one. Really? What can you expand on that? In Buck in Buck Singh. Can you can you expand on what you just what you just wrote? In four, what is four? Yes, yes, how, how does it contradict with four? Question four. It says composed of local inhabitants. Does it contradict or does it actually tally? Do they actually tally? No less favorable then. Well, if you were paid one hundred dollars before ninety seven, you will be you will at least be paid the same, if not better. So you will not be paid ninety nine dollars, and uh, there's no promise that you will be paid more than one hundred dollars, but at least the same. 
so no less favorable. About that's of diminishing salary, and then there are other conditions of service, uh, in addition to the payment of salaries, such as housing allowances, education allowance, um, travel allowance, and many others. The provision of quarters. Um, those are terms of, you know, condition of service. And uh, the the reason that it was written in that way was to instill confidence on the civil servants and uh, provide the incentive for them to continue serving the government uh, after 1997. And that, of course, uh, is uh, consistent with uh, um, what is in the Joint Declaration and also in the uh, uh, Basic Law, Article 5. And you see Article 5 says, the socialist system, uh, <coughs> this is Article 5, and uh, <laughs> I lost it. It's on the circuit. Right? It says, shall remain unchanged. Right? And of course, it says, for 50 years. For 50 years. What do you mean? And is it exactly uh, June 30th, 2047, would be the end of that 50 years? And therefore, from then on, things will change or can things can can things continue to remain unchanged or we are now you know 2020 uh, December 2020 so 47 2047 will be another 27 years to go uh, not quite 27 but maybe 26 something because it's going to be if we are talking about the exact five years it will be that will end come June 30th, 2047. Okay. Um, the next one, uh, question five. Question five, uh, we will uh, spend at least one lesson on uh, protection of uh, uh, various rights given to citizens of Hong Kong. And uh, we say there are at least eight articles which reflect that. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 3 of the Basic Law <coughs> uh, bears the title Fundamental Rights and Duties of uh, the Residents. As far as protection of rights are concerned, the most important provision, let's not go to every one of them, but the most important one is what, is what which is the most important one. Anybody? Twenty seven? Let's see. Why twenty seven? Hong Kong residents shall have freedom of speech, press. Publication, association, assembly, procession, demonstration, and uh, trade union and strike. Ah, freedom of speech. Okay. Yeah. Good. Freedom of speech. 
Yeah, I accept that. But uh, indeed, we can also consider um, one other. Oh. Since say article 39, 39. This one, the importance lies with the fact that this international covenants basically encapsulates all the other, all the basic rights uh, set out in in in, uh, in the individual sections or articles. Uh, and, and here it says that. Um, the provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and also the International Covenant on Economics and Social and Cultural Rights and International Labour Conventions as applied to Hong Kong shall remain in force and shall be implemented through the laws of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights will include all the fundamental rights that uh, we are concerned about, including freedom of speech, freedom in practice to participate in public life, and many other. <coughs> This international covenant, um, yes, Article 30, the same, and you will find that uh, uh, in the <coughs> you will find that uh, uh, freedom of and uh, of privacy and communication is also contained in this international covenant. But on this one, you have to note <clears throat> that it is not the covenant itself, but it is those parts which apply to Hong Kong shall remain in force. So there may be some provisions which do not apply to Hong Kong, and it, and if that's the case, then uh, we don't use the international covenant as a, a basis for claiming to exercise these fundamental rights. And uh, we, I've just, we just flag it up here to say that uh, uh, when we mention international covenant in Article 39, it doesn't mean that they can apply directly to Hong Kong and Hong Kong people. It has to be applied to Hong Kong through laws implemented, through laws enacted. And this is the last part. He says, shall be implemented through the laws of Hong Kong SAR. So if Hong Kong SAR did not make any law to apply the provisions of the ICCPR, then arguably, there will be there may be a failure on the part of mainland China to honor uh, the uh, 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 declaration. So, Article Thirty Nine. Uh, we're going to come back to it. How the courts been interpreting this provision in Hong Kong. Okay. Um. Mpaxing, you make reference to Article 30. <coughs> On freedom of. <coughs> excuse me. Freedom of speech. The freedom 
of privacy and, and, and privacy of communication shall be protected by law. No department or individual may, on any ground, infringe upon the freedom and privacy of communication, except American authorities may inspect communication in accordance with legal procedure to meet the needs of public security or investigate into criminal offenses. Yes, you are right. Uh, that, of course, is important. Um, it's a standalone uh, protection uh, as opposed to one that can be found within the international conference. Okay, <coughs> I think that. Oh, let me see. Um, Can we turn to 11? 11. The maintenance of public order in Hong Kong SAR will be responsibility of the government of Hong Kong SAR. The maintenance of public order. in terms of public order. With the, um, <clears throat> the, the social unrest uh, last year, there were some talks about uh, bringing um, the, the uh, People's Liberation Army uh, uh, into Hong Kong or onto the streets of Hong Kong to help quell the social unrest then. Question 11 is, the maintenance of public order is the responsibility of government of Hong Kong as they are. So, uh, Yes, Mr. Wong says Article 14, there are two. Let's look at it. Article 14, there are two. Well, this is one which, uh, again, drew a lot of debate. And the uh, first paragraph says the CBG is responsible for the defense of Hong Kong SAR. Second, the government shall be responsible for the main for maintenance of public order in the region. Maintenance of public order. And uh, in addition to abiding by national laws, members of the garrison uh, have to be abided by laws of Hong Kong as they are. And uh, para two um, Article 14. How is it relevant though? Um, it says should be responsible for public order. Can Hong Kong government actually co appoint the People's Liberation Army stationed in Hong Kong to assist the 
the, 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 the government of Hong Kong or for the matter police uh, in the maintenance of public order can that be done? I mean under the law, under the basic law So, um, for, for here, we have to look at uh, Article, I mean, Paragraph 3 at the same time. And uh, on the face of it, it is only when the government uh, found that it was at a state, at a situation where um, uh, 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 the, the the risk involve uh, national security and uh, and here you can look at article 18 article 18 4 it says in the event that the standing committee declare war or by reason of turmoil within SAR which endangers national unity or security and is beyond the control of government of Hong Kong decides that the region is in a state of emergency, then the CPG may issue an order applying the relevant national laws in the region. So the basic law does recognize uh, some uh, a possible situation where uh, 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 there was turmoil and uh, it, it, it was endangering national security and it's beyond the control of the Hong Kong SAR government. So the, the relationship between the central authority and uh, the uh, SK, HKSAR uh, can be found there. Um, so then coming back to the question, maintenance of public order will be the responsibility of government of Hong Kong. There's no doubt about it. It is the responsible. But um, the, the basic law has made such provisions that if it concerns a situation where Hong Kong government was it was it was beyond Hong Kong government's capability uh, to 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 uh, defend its, uh, to uh, maintain law and order, and if national unity, national state, uh, this national sovereignty is uh, at stake, then um, the CPG uh, can do something. Uh -huh. And um, one of which is to apply relevant national laws in the region. Okay. Right. So that's what I would like to cover for the moment. Uh, this is just, you know, we, we don't have all the time that we needed, but uh, please uh, do uh, uh, spend some time just going through the basic law and uh, matching it with the joint declaration that you find in the appendix to chapter 2 of the menu. Are we all right there? I, I, I want to uh, go back to our slides. Are there any questions from what we just done? All right. Now I'll... Uh, I will... Um, I will turn this off. Hi, good. Then we will look at what is the basic law. All right, here's this one. In the Court of Appeal, uh, the case of uh, HKSAR against David Ma, 1997, the case itself is a criminal case uh, where there was a challenge about the validity of certain indictment, uh, which so happens the proceedings straddle 1997 to 1997, and there was argument on the defense side that uh, the indictment, the charge, did not survive. 
and the the resumption of sovereignty. Uh, the court ruled against that uh, allegation, and the judgment, which was a very um, useful for understanding the um, uh, constitutional order uh, that you know started running first of July nineteen ninety seven. And also uh, set out the history and uh, also put a lot of emphasis on the need to have continuity. Uh, that is uh, David Ma. Uh, and in that case, in that judgment, the main judgment, also uh, the basic law, it was described as uh, having three dimensions. One is the international dimension. And second one is the domestic, or if you like, China dimension. The third one is constitutional dimension, which um, uh, involve examining uh, the position of Hong Kong and the system uh, that had been in place uh, since very early days, uh, 1842, uh, to present day Hong Kong. Uh, these dimensions, like the, the international dimension, you you will see that uh, the how is related to the basic policies that PRC had undertaken, uh, and that of course brings in the international. I.e., it is. Hong Kong is now representing herself to the rest of the world. Although uh, these are basic policies which were stated in the Joint Declaration, it is an international treaty registered with the UN. In my way, the court held that international dimension of the to the basic law uh, because implement. Why is that implement international dimension? Because uh, the agreement uh, I think oh, it just, just escaped me what the name of the of the covenant of the international covenant. Anyway, it was um, uh, in the context that uh, the Hong Kong Basic Law was implementing. Uh, and implementing what was uh, contained in the joint declarations, which is an international treaty. Is this still important? Yes, of course, historically, uh, although <clears throat> it doesn't mention some important issues such as universal suffrage. And back in 2017, Four years ago, three four years ago, the Chinese Foreign Ministry said the Joint Declaration's historical document that no longer has any realistic meaning. Really, you know, in two thousand seventeen, and uh, that was uh, around the time when the White Book, the the White Book was issued. And they asked her why, and do you agree? Historical documents that no longer has any realistic money. Okay, and uh, do you agree? Historical document that no longer has any realistic meaning. Do you agree? Anyone? Anyone? <clears throat> it says the Chinese, the joint declaration is history and uh, there's no realistic meaning in it.
How does it depends? Hmm? Can you tell me? Or tell us? Depends on what? I thought uh, Chen Pei Ho, you were going to write something more about it depends. Would you like to discuss this rather than rather than writing it, Chen Pei? Didn't see your name there. <clears throat> I don't see your name on the list of attendees. Chen Peck. Chen Peck Ho. Are you no longer there? Or, or are you the, are you the Michael or? I just don't. I just didn't find you. Well, remember we saw that document uh, registered with the UN as it in the treaty depository. As an international treaty, yes. So, does it have any realistic meaning today in the view of Hong Kongers? The answer is no. No meaning what you do not agree. So it has realistic meaning. Can you tell us how what 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 are those meanings? What are what's, what is that realistic meaning that uh, that it has. Actually, if we can talk, then we can cover more grounds than the Having to uh, wait for you to type, although you, I know, I, I know you can type very fast. But uh, uh, let me turn your turn your microphone on there. Can you hear me? Without without um, going into legal legal uh, 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 debate, or, or rather without approaching this question from a legal point of view, uh, Pino, you said it was a political declaration. Mm -hmm.
It is treaty. Is a, an, a, it is a. But、uh, you're quite right. It says in the、uh, joint declaration that it is a declaration of the basic policy. Is、uh, can, but can you un, un, can you understand it as a promise given by PRC to at least to UK, if not the rest of the world? This may seem to be a complicated. A、uh, legal question because it involves international law, and、uh, but for practical purpose, of course, the joint declaration does enjoy、uh, does have its significance in the history of Hong Kong. The question then is,、um, but but the question really is, what what about in law in our in our legal system?、Um, What effect does it have on our laws? Can can we make reference to the joint declaration、uh, in order to、um, uh, run certain arguments in court? You will see the next bullet point. I said joint declaration actually is still used by Hong Kong courts in some cases. Right. So this is the courts are. Um, are aware of、uh, the historical background to and 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 the and the facts that led to the signing of the joint declarations, and in, within that there is a declaration of the basic policy、uh, with elaboration, and all these. Are also reflected, so it, so the promise go、uh, in the basic law, and、uh, in an appropriate case,、uh, the courts may actually resort to looking at、uh, the joint declaration for the purpose of assisting the court in interpreting、uh, provisions of the basic law.、Right. So that is this is important in that sense,、um, but this. A treaty, or you like this joint declaration, is different from normal, the 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 the, the, the common form of, of treaties, where many of them will contain a complaint mechanism and a judication mechanism, and also mechanisms uh, that um, uh, are that provide for the for the ratification of any wrong or any or breaches of undertaking. Contained in the in the treaty. Um. But before we move on, we have to make clear that the joint declaration itself, uh, is not law in Hong Kong. This is because of our legal system. The legal system we have in this context is a dualism. A dualism uh, uh, system, dual, d a u a l, dualism, which means that、um, uh, uh, international obligations uh, uh, undertaken by the government in international law do not become part of the local law until the undertaking、uh, or promise is turned into a local law passed by. Uh, the local legislature, then it will have the legal effect. It will have legal effect. Otherwise,、uh, it is simply not directly enforceable in court in Hong Kong.、Uh, and、uh, the courts had, like in the case of Ngaling and the case of Gurung Kash Bahado,、uh, where it was necessary to. Understand the purpose and the context of certain provisions of the Basic Law. That it was found that what the content of the joint declarations,、uh, or indeed what the what the state parties had declared,、uh, was relevant to assist the court in assisting the court to uh, 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 
interpret provisions of the basic law. And so to that extent, joint declaration may be considered still uh, relevant and useful. So that's the international dimension and domestic dimension. We say domestic dimension means the status of Hong Kong basic law as a national law in all of China, not only in Hong Kong. So this is the basic law and you don't waive the basic law. The basic law is a piece of national law. And because it is national law, it applies to every part of the of the PRC. And because it is not, it was enacted by MPC and the rules contained in the joint declaration the basic law are equally applicable both to PRC China and to Hong Kong. And to Hong Kong. What is National People's Congress? We, we cover a bit of this uh, when the, we look at the, or the Constitution. It's referred to as the highest organ of state power. Highest organ of state power. It makes all the most important laws, and these laws are usually called basic laws. Basic laws, not the basic law of Hong Kong CR, but basic laws. Do you know how many delegates there are in the in the um, MPC? How many delegates? How many deputies are there? Any idea? Can you guess? No. <laughs> yes, around three thousand. That's right. It's more than three thousand. It's around three two nine eight oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> it makes all the most important laws uh, that are known as basic laws. Um, the making of laws uh, follow procedures uh, set out set down in their rules of in their rules of procedure. Um, in Hong Kong, you, remember, you will know that uh, there are three readings: first reading, second reading, and third reading uh, for a law to be passed, or before a law can be passed, uh, or rather, can a bill a bill can be passes into an ordinance. Um, National People's Congress, there's no three reading as such, but uh, in recent times, a bill or a, or a, 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 a draft law, uh, uh, important ones, especially they, they may take more than two times or sometimes three times before they can be uh, passed into law. And uh, apart from making laws, do not forget this is a body which exercises supervision over the executive, over the legislature, and over the judiciary. So everything into one into one organ. Basic law Jiban Fa Lu. this is a generic term. When it is being used as a generic term as opposed to a specific name, uh, it refers to name of a law made by the 
at National People's Congress, the NPC. This means that all the laws made by NPC are called basic laws. So the Hong Kong SAR is an example. And uh, indeed, uh, if you deal with um, when you deal with mainland China uh, in, in law, you will find other laws uh, being described, understood as a, the basic law. So, uh, for our purpose, we often encourage students to use the expression Hong Kong basic law as opposed to simply basic law, which might be misunderstood. We look at this just earlier in the, uh, when we are looking at the Chinese constitution. NPC exercises functions and powers, including the enactment of an amendment to the basic law. It's more than 3,000 a year. Uh, this depends on the population and on there's some other factors, but 3,000 is round about is about right. Each term, but then standing committee will have, I think, 170 something, less, to, less than 200. Sometimes as few as uh, 1,500. Each term is five years, and they only meet once a year for two weeks, and usually start in March. And there are limits on how much, therefore, how much work you can do, because meeting time is relatively short. Standing committee, they work more often, two times, uh, I mean, once every two months they meet, and uh, they, they, they perform functions in between NBC fun sessions. And this includes the interpreting, interpreting the law, including Hong Kong Basic Law, receiving laws made by Hong Kong legislature for the record, and other tasks relating to Hong Kong basic law. Uh, so it's, we, I just, we just highlight the power to interpret because it, it, in reality, it is, it is um, um, the ultimate authority in reality. Now, an interesting question, since uh, China uh, is uh, a sovereign state, and the question then is, can laws made by NBC have the limiting effect or restricting effect on PRC? Well, of course, uh, we are talking about strict, pure law. Of course they can. You can really, by law, restrict Chinese authorities what to do. And then the, uh, any formal relationship has to be backed up by provisions of the basic law in Chapter 2. For example, Ch Article 22, Bracket 1, that concern the Chinese uh, people from other parts of China coming to Hong Kong uh, requires uh, the, the uh, uh, authorities in China to approve it. Hmm. And there are also other exceptions. We shan't go into those. Uh, Article 20 bracket, uh, 22 bracket 1 says no department of the CPG and no province, autonomous region or municipality directly under the CPG may interfere in the affairs which the Hong Kong SAR administers on its own in accordance with this law. So that is uh, a, a clear provision which um, ring fenced Hong Kong 
uh, against interference even from China, from mainland China. Constitutional dimension. We have constitutional dimension of the basic law. What are you talking about? Well, it means the status of Hong Kong based law within Hong Kong. Right? This is about constitutional dimension. Within Hong Kong, we say yes, but it is not relationship between constitution and the PRC. And in China, Hong Kong based law is only one of the many basic laws, but in Hong Kong, Hong Kong basic law is the highest law per practical effect. And very often, this small constitution are uh, continue to be called constitution by by our courts here. Obviously, um, these are the uh, clearly uh, established the status of Hong Kong Basic Law. So, what is a constitution? A constitution usually is an important document which applies throughout, you know, to, uh, throughout this, this nation. And it is invariably you will find the system of government is described therein, and the rights and duties of residents are also there. Uh, and uh, and if you wanted to keep this for as long as it can be kept, um, then it would be wise to to make bigger containers and um, and you find that. Um, it is so contained and harder to be changed. Now, um, the Hong Kong Basic Law uh, is not easy for, for it to be amended. Article 159 uh, does provide a mechanism to amend it, and that involve that would involve uh, at least. But involve um, uh, must be the National People's Congress, right? So the and um, whereas in 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 the PRC Constitution, uh, the amendment con mechanism is very uh, it requires a special majority, and um, let me tell you there and. Um, Um, <clears throat> and the other characteristic of uh, of a constitution is by point number three here. It says other laws usually invalid if it is inconsistent with the con with the constitution. This is a general statement, and uh, as far as Hong Kong basic law is concerned, I had already drawn your attention to Article Eleven, uh, which. Uh, 
is the provision which says that no law uh, made by Hong Kong, uh, no laws made can contravene the basic law. So that's Article 11 of the basic law. So because of that, it seemed uh, because of that, uh, there, uh, the Hong Kong basic law is sometimes also described as a constitutional uh, document. A constitutional document, although it is not a constitution, it is not a constitution. The in starting law, uh, uh, this, uh, there are in many cases, well, in starting law in the common law system. Uh, uh, you will see that you will find it necessary very often to make reference to um, uh, contents of a judicial judgment, a judgment made by the court, which uh, we, um, which are identified as the reasons for making a certain decision. Now, these reasons uh, will may be expressed in in terms of a principle. That becomes what we call a ratio decidendi, and if that was from a superior court, a higher a court of a higher status, then it may become it will be binding on the courts below them, and and therefore uh, it is in 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 studying law, uh, judicial cases are so important. In our case, the study of the basic law. Of course, what the judges said, uh, and 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 if they are in they, they, what the judges said is a matter of principle, then it is also uh, it will also have binding effect. Um, in the case of Nanning, which is a court of final appeal case, um, it concerns the uh, right of a bow of uh, children born to parents who uh, some of them were not Hong Kong residents when they were born but later became a Hong Kong resident Hong Kong having a right to a bow here they will be they will have uh, 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 the issue then was under article 24 of the basic law whether these children uh, 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 will be qualified to hold uh, to have the the, the, the status of a Hong Kong permanent resident. Now, all, all that, in that context, uh, the court had made the following statements. It says the basic law is a national law and is the constitution of the region. And like other constitutions, it distributes and delimits powers as well as providing for fundamental rights and freedoms. As with other constitutions, laws which are inconsistent with the basic law are of no effect and are invalid. All these are uh, fundamental principles in the in, in in common law in relation to constitutional documents. Um, the only objection here, contention, is uh, the description of the basic law as a constitution of the region. I again I had explained to you that this was considered by uh, some to be not accurate in the com constitutional law, law sense because Hong Kong is not a place uh, possessed of sovereign power. The sovereign power lies with PRC, not Hong Kong, and therefore Hong Kong cannot have its own constitution. So the Hong Kong Basic Law and the PRC Constitution of 82. Uh, and we have been looking at the dim three dimensions of the basic law. Those three dimensions are the international dimension and uh, yes. the constitutional dimension and domestic dimension. Right, international dimension principally because it's uh, uh, g g giving effect to what was contained in the joint declaration, 
domestic dimension, so it's the relationship uh, with the with main in China, and the constitutional dimension, i.e., having the effect some uh, effects that the commonly possessed by constitutions, but it cannot be a constitution. So these are the three dimensions. If not for anything, I hope uh, 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 after tonight you will it will reinforce and enhance your understanding of uh, the constitutional framework in which Hong Kong was established as a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China and the basic law was enacted in order to give effect to the basic policies declared by PRC in the joint declarations between the UK government and the PRC government. So that, I thought, at least uh, well, would be something to take home. Can we have more to answer? No. Activity 2? Oh, no. Um, I don't give more to answers, but uh, uh, it's the, the, the skill, the process that I want you to go through. The, this, as I had I kept re re repeating, itself doesn't require any intellectual um, uh, 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 challenge. Question 9. Okay, let's look at question 9. Um, I, 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 I wanted you to actually go through this by yourself so that it will be get stick in your mind. The Hong Kong about you no know, the relationship between the Hong Kong AC law and the and the JD. Nine, the Hong Kong SAR may establish mutually beneficial economic relationship with the UK and other countries whose economic interests in Hong Kong will be given due regard. It, it identify this one article in the Hong Kong Basic Law that reflects the above basic policy. Yes, uh, one five one. Let's see. <clears throat> is 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 that you know? Uh, uh, <clears throat> that's right. That's exactly it. One five one. And uh, indeed, as I said to you, uh, um we can enter into relationship with the we we are, we are act, I mean we I mean Hong Kong SAR is a member of WTO also uh, in the area of uh, economic economy economics economy I mean One five six as well. They are all. In fact, um, you remember uh, one of the key uh, objectives of the uh, Basic Law was to maintain prosperity and stability of Hong Kong. And prosperity, talking about economic prosperity. And when you look at uh, uh, Chapter Seven, uh, all these go to that end. They are go go for achieving this helping or uh, ensuring that Hong Kong will continue um, its uh, uh, economic its, uh, um, identity in the international uh, uh, commercial arena. Oh, uh, don't worry about overlapping because uh, question 10 identified two articles that reflect about basic policy and the policy being Hong Kong China. Yep, that, you, you're right, they, they overlap, they overlap. But Hong Kong, China, more importantly, this is uh, a means that China insisted uh, in order to uh, um, um, reflect uh, 
the sovereignty over Hong Kong. Other questions? Other questions, please? Roll back. Uh, when you say roll back, what does it mean by roll back? Um, you will remember, um, yes, exactly, I was going to say, there, there was legislation passed to um, uh, uh, reduce civil service pay. And it was argued in court that that law contravened the basic law. And uh, that's, that proposition was the, uh, denied, that, that was not accepted. So no less favorable than before is um, a, a reference to um, the overall picture and of course uh, subject to uh, Hong Kong government is able has the ability to uh, honor or to to honor that um, uh, 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 conditions of pay and uh, and therefore uh, I can't remember the year that was 19, I think it was um, uh, was it was it the Asian financial crisis in any event um, uh, that's what explain why uh, uh, an ordinance has to be enacted in order to give effect to that reduction of pay Okay, um, let's st uh, uh, stop here tonight. Um, <clears throat> our next meeting, I think, should be next Tuesday, and um, we will continue with uh, Chapter Three. Was it two thousand and two? I, I can't remember exactly. I, I I can I can find it out quite quite quickly. Um, but uh, for the next lecture, we will be uh, we will still be on on the uh, chapter three and then on to chapter four. Hopefully, we we'll, we we will uh, uh, looking we will be looking more at the high degree of autonomy under one country two systems. Excuse me. So thank you so much. I'm still. Uh, uh, hoping that um, I could hear your voices um, during class uh, because it will be more effective uh, uh, for us uh, uh, discussing the issues rather than taking time uh, to have uh, your views typed out and that sort of slow down things. Thank you very much and uh, good night to you all. Thank you so much.